Welcome to Eric Presser Bank. Uh, my name is Jonas Tullin. I'm Head of Asset Management and I will try to go through uh, our house view as swiftly as possible. There are about 70 pages but I think it's quite important now because there's been so much going on now with the US election and we have changed our global equity portfolio quite uh, quite considerably also ahead of the elections um, and I will explain why and how. The methodology is the same as always. We are a quant house, so in terms of macro market, we do it at least from an economical point of view. Um, we try to, to, to give equal consideration to all theoretical schools uh, that are present in, in macro. Uh, and then basically take it from there. Um, first off in this presentation, I'm focusing on the data points that are coming out this week. I think they will actually take uh, sort of be the B story uh, in, in a sense of what's going on with the US election in terms of just market moves. Um, but I would like to highlight the things like Boulder here, especially in terms of US retail sales production and building starts and, and, and housing in US. We think in our models we forecast a little rebound in US retail sales. We think it's quite encouraging that we look at credit data or credit card data that we can't really see a sharp slowdown or anything is still maintaining growth, uh, etc. So we think we can actually clock in at 0.5, which would be quite quite a good good number. Would that mean higher rates, lower equities? Not necessarily, because we also get production, which we think is actually going to come in a bit softer on a year-on-year -year growth basis. So it can actually be an equal balance in terms of those two data points, leaving the weight for this week for the US and markets on US housing data. The pricing on US house, the house price development is collapsing, obviously, which we think is what we anticipated is going to put a, a wet blanket on the owner equivalent rent, which is obviously driving the CPI. Importantly though, in terms of housing activity data, we can't really see the same fall. And this is really sort of the trick of the US economy right now, that we are squeezing financial conditions so we take a, 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 we can sort of beat down the house price appreciation, but we might not undermine the fundamentals in the housing sector. Now, this is sort of the thin line that the Fed is trying to walk so far successfully. Uh, if, if you look at building starts or, 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 or building permits and housing starts, you can see that yes, we see a slowdown, but it's actually leveling out about 2.5% year-on-year annual GDP growth, given the calculations that's been fairly good in, in front-running in GDP since the 1950s. So, slowing, fine, no recession sight yet. In terms of our house view, everything here is unchanged. Yes, we're still calling the Fed uh, uh, hawkishness pivot. Peak yields and peak inflation is playing out. Uh, most of these factors are probably behind us as we speak, which we think is great. That's been our, our house view for, for, for uh, the second half of the year. Our strategy is maintained. Uh, what we have done, as you can see here, in a week is CEC. Uh, we are actually making some moves here. And we bought US Treasuries, um, la -da -da, and after months of avoiding, we actually bought back into the Eurozone again. So if you look at the strategies that we have implemented, we're still in the soft landing camp. Yes, we're going to have a energy crisis in Europe. We think that's largely priced. Um, we still we have worked with midterms. We actually made some trades ahead of that, and I'll come back to that because that's the, uh, the, the, the Eurozone and, and the Nordics trade. CPI firmly peaked. Yes, we've maintained that a couple of months now um, and obviously it's a lot easier given the pricing reaction that we saw from the last CPI number, but you know that's all yeah, just more wind in the sails for us. Fed peak hawkishness is behind us in fixed income markets. We claim that the equity market should catch up to this. We think the equity market is starting to catch up to this. Um, and down here that we have troughed in Eurozone equities and we're quite, quite actually now the first, first time actually reinvested and we have a large allocation usually to Nordics. Now the underlying reasons why the equity market is well supported and is actually climbing, uh, I made a short list here of, of various ways of looking at the equity market and I think we know that in, at least from the eyes of these um, uh, analysis and more so I should add, they are all supportive of the US equity market. It's, I would even argue that if you leave the thinking, believing, assuming world, perhaps not the thinking world, but it's in assuming and, and, and extrapolating or, or, or con being worried or concerned, it's very difficult to econometrically derive a th theorems that are actually a negative for the equity market. And that has been the case, I would argue, since June. So we caught the, for us, the, our global equity portfolios troughed in, in back in June. 
And it's quite interesting now that the last little chips to sort of add to this game are flows, gamma, uh, option positioning and, and share buybacks. We already have the earnings revisions, we already have the daily trading model, we already have the sell-off, those are exhausted, etc. Et so everything is, is actually speaking of continued equity appreciation. Now that's great in a world where you have to be tactically very active. The strategic portfolio allocation has delivered virtually zero this year, actually quite negative if you're going to be, be truthfully. That's because equities and yields have both plummeted. By choosing which asset you can be tactically active in, you can actually shift uh, the weights accordingly. Now, this is our portfolios. Um, and uh, well, some of the portfolios, these are the bigger portfolios we have, low risk, medium risk, global equities, global sustainable equities and rates and, and global uh, sustainable rates. Above 80% of these are, are above their, the index levels, uh, so, so that we, we have a green light on this. Uh, quite interestingly, um, we, we think that, yes, we're, we're down pretty much, if you look at 2022 here, we're down all, all across the boards. So we still are fighting a tough year. Yes, we're beating index, but that's sort of a uh, second degree kind of band-aid, if you can call it that. Uh, we, we're still chasing all absolute returns, of course, um, but at least it's, it's better than being as bad as, as the index. And that's obviously due to our currency work. Uh, our shoes of strategies in global equities, so our trough since June is holding up relatively well uh, compared to the global benchmark index. Um, now we added Eurozone, and why on earth did we do that? Well, th this could be one of those trades that are really easy to look at in six, nine months time, because if we're right, our, the GDP momentum is troughing, and we're not talking about actual GDP, because remember, we still have to face a negative GDP growth and recession in the Eurozone area, probably out to Q3 next year. However, uh, in terms of the momentum in the economy, we think actually the second derivative is troughing, and that's what I'm trying to show here. And that we know is quite correlated to the equity moves. So you know the old saying, the equity market should front run the, the, the macro with six to nine months. Well, this might be it for, for the Eurozone, and that's why we do the position. Uh, it's, is it aggressive? I, I don't know if it's too aggressive. I mean, we just follow pretty much data. Uh, we also increased our node exposure. Um, so so it's, it's quite interesting that just as we are entering the recession from an official GDP number basis, the equity markets are actually saying, we're done with that. That's what we've done. Uh, so now we're going to start to chase uh, sort of the, 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 the rebound. And there are a few countries leading this in Europe. Uh, the Nordics being a few of them, and then you have especially France, uh, and to some degree actually Italy, but we have to, we're a bit wary of Italy debt and how they're going to finance that, so we've chosen a different strategy. Uh, in terms of second derivatives, yes, we believe that the OECD leading indicator for Germany will start to trough. That's our leading indicator of the leading indicator, just to make everything a bit more confused, but to front run OECD's official leading indicators is not that difficult. Um, and, and, and hopefully this trough that we can see in chemicals is also holding. Now earnings revisions in Sweden is developing quite strongly, I would argue, but it's a huge difference underneath this earnings on who actually are getting the earnings or not. And I'm trying to pinpoint that world in, in this graph. Because Sweden and, and a few other countries um, have a quite interesting outlook. Now we have a collapsed consumer before the Riks Bank start hiking rates. We were already on a year-on-year -year basis at levels that we saw in the financial crisis of the 90s uh, recession. At the same time, we have a manufacturing side of, of our cycle, obviously helped by the corona and the global economy, which is sort of almost in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, a strong business cycle uh, growth area. Uh, so you have a collapsing consumer and your strong manufacturing. So basically, depending on who your neighbors are, you can have one being super bullish and one being super bearish, and both are absolutely right. If you utilize the spread between these two, you can actually see the manufacturing versus consumer uh, is a quite rare spread. Traditionally, and I just put it here versus the OMX, you can actually see this has actually been quite constructive of the um, uh, equity market. Basically, because the Riks Bank won't be able to hike because they're already, even before they start hiking, the consumer's pretty much rolled over um, or driven into the ditch. 
that's quite interesting given, given what's happening now with the CPI this coming week, which is always going to be a strong number. Uh, unfortunately, Swedish Riks Bank is not really um, independent in the sense that we're just uh, a suburb to, to Berlin in that sense. Uh, we just follow the ECB. But if we were independent from the Riks Bank, they would probably look at this and say maybe they should slow off a bit on the hiking cycle. And that obviously has some interesting effects on, on Krona as well as consumer. However, we all know that they would probably try to ha hang on to the ECB as they, has been their strategy for, for the last uh, few years, or last couple of years. That said, uh, this creates opportunities as well on, on positioning uh, accordingly, because obviously short retail, long manufacturing. You don't have to be, be, uh, be a rocket scientist to, to, to see that in the graphs. Um, now, at the same time, we're a bit wary of the dollar. Now, that's because the three forward one year rate on the on US, i.e., future uh, central bank uh, rate cycles, are indicating that the ECB would have to hang on longer than the US. Obviously, that is because the US can kill off their uh, inflation by hiking because they have a large degree of demand re re inflation. In Sweden and Europe, it's more supply led, hence, the rate hikes won't be sufficient, so they're going to have to be l l higher for longer in that sense. Now, from a business cycle point of view, that could be quite, quite dangerous. And that's why, you know, when we increase euros, so we start with one chip on the table, not more than so. Uh, and if anything, they're going to gonna throw in the towel on that one. Um, now, in terms of more, I mean, net savings in the US is also coming in lower. Traditional swap spreads talk the same language, positionings talk the same language. So no matter where we're looking, we can see the same thing. And if you're looking at SEEK, why we've chosen this time to increase the, our exposure to Nordics and try to front run this massive dollar strengthening, also the dollar weakening we've seen, which we catched uh, or caught, um, is because these two blue time series, where we can see that we have had tremendous outflows from Swedish capital markets, which has hurt liquidity and all of a sudden we get inflows. Uh, these are on the equity side, um, and, and, uh, and these are equities and bonds. Now this is quite interesting and quite obviously supportive for the uh, Krona, uh, which you can see, which is why then we increased Nordics and, and, and then this whole trophy. So that's really the case behind, um, behind why we increased on the, on the Eurozone. So we're trying to capture second derivative. We think that we have price recessions coming on. So the equity market has to do the trick to front run the next step of the, of the um, business cycle, which is going to be a trough and then a, a, a rebound, even though that's going to happen within you know, Q3s next year. Um, that's, this is the work that we're doing in the markets. And we also increased uh, Sweden, but carefully on, in terms of, of, of advocating more on, on the manufacturing side, um, but also encouraged by the fact that Swedish Krona is going to have a stronger day in terms of flows and, and, and outlook. So these are the strategies we've implemented. They're all the same. Uh, you know, CPI peak, Fed peak hawkishness, Fed pivot, all that is maintained since a couple of months back, but we added Eurozone and, and Sweden. Now in terms of political risk in the US, we can actually see it, uh, this is invert, so it peaks and then sort of rebounds. So the election is largely to, uh, over. It's still sort of uh, uncertain what's going to happen to the Rep Republicans and the House of Representatives. But that the fact that the election is over is quite, quite appealing to the market. So we don't have to go through you know, who's going to win what, because I think at the end of the day, what's most important for us is that we see the next step. So we have the election, we're going to have an outcome. We can all debate you know, what's going to be the final verdict. But at the end of the day, we need to see this picture change. And what you can see here is falling political uncertainty all throughout 2021. I, things are working. And then you enter 2022, 2022, and you know you have the midterms. And all of a sudden, the policy uncertainty is increasing. It's inverted here. It's increasing and it's choppy and it's just not rates with the Fed. It's all, pretty much all, it's healthcare, trade, government spending, taxes, fiscal, regulations, national security. It's a little bit of a mess. It's a mess situation. So we need to get the election done and over. And then, thankfully, um, the, at least the, 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 the Democrats have said if we lose House of Representatives, we're going to push through uh, the budget ceiling for you know, this big worry that we have next summer. Uh, even though it's a lame duck session until the new uh, House of um, the new Congress is sworn in on the 3rd of January, they're going to push through legislation to postpone that, which I think is, is quite great. So hopefully, this is what we can be. Uh, focusing on the next time around, i.e. that the, the policy uncertainty is slowly falling away. 
and you can you can sort of pinpoint various uh, trends and try to see how it corresponds to equity markets. Um, now, from a hopefully lower policy uncertainty following the election, uh, we come into the inflation, and this main case here is absolutely maintained from us. Price inflation peaked in March. That's our forecast from uh, April. Uh, sorry, from March, uh, and, and we're, we're holding that. Uh, we're, not, we're not changed here. I mean, the market will price in lower and lower uh, consecutive um, uh, moves in break evens, and that's what they have done. Uh, that is because the supply bottlenecks is they have collapsed a long time ago. This is actually our forecast from from 2021. There are no news here, really. Um, the, the only thing that then has to happen is that the headline CPI gets traction and it starts falling. And it, it is. Uh, so, so I think this is quite, quite a... Um, uh, well, our conclusion is the same. We don't go as far as, as argue for deflation, um, but just slower and slower CPI is, is sort of the key of the game. So why were we so aggressive ahead of the last CPI number? Well, one of the reasons is the development in Chinese pricing structure, where you can see that PPI uh, level right now is actually in deflation. And obviously that has a long track record of, of, of front-running US cost pressure, i.e. The, 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 the spread CPI, PPI in China. And obviously a help of, of Chinese. So you have supply bottlenecks, you have the price markets, you have consumer expectations, you have the break evens curves. So if you are uh, tactically active, which we try to be, you can actually buy into this. A long time ago, we would argue you had to buy into this back in June, which is where you could, were we able, we were able at least to create a trough in global equities uh, in order then to just to be patient because the market has to come to this and the equities will wake up, which we've been writing this now for, for a couple of months. And right now we think we got the markets with us. We've got winner our sales, so we can sort of more uh, lean back and start to do what I call luxury asset management, i.e. we can start to choose between relative winners run trying to avoid uh, absolute losers. So that's a huge change, obviously, for the, for the market. Um, now, in terms of the uh, rates, and, and, and this is really, I mean, the rate market is coming off, i.e. lower peak, quicker cuts, lower endpoint from the Fed. Now, do take notice of this graph that already from early Q2 this year, we could see the market price in cuts uh, within you know, 20, 24 months. You're actually up now to four cuts. This is actually updated today from 3.2 uh, to, to, to 3.9. So you have four rate cuts within the next 24 months. Uh, and obviously that's a reflection of the, uh, the, the, the drop-off that we're going to see in CPI. Now the Fed has been catching on to this and they've been quite uh, dovish in the speak, at least if you look at their own uh, natural, natural language processing uh, programming of, of their own written word. Uh, the market has been tugging along, so i.e. the chance of a 75 basis points hike uh, in December. This is the December contracts, the blues are, are 75 basis points hikes, has been falling away and in giving a space for the 50, uh, which obviously was the pivot back in October. So this is sort of the name of the game and this is what it's going to play out. So you're going to see 15 in, and they're going to slow slower rate hikes and then they're going to stop and then they're going to start cutting rates again. Um, obviously macro is pointing up to this, everything, everything, all types of variables are, are catching into this. We have bought uh, US Treasuries 10 year. Um, and we've done so in, in Euro, trying to play this, this fall off, which is obviously a lot more comfortable to talk about that today than we were perhaps when we, we had to face an adverse move. Uh, but we're sticking to this because the, the Mac is doing their, their quite uh, apparent or obvious uh, selection. The swap spreads are doing the same thing. And uh, we also know that we are behind, uh, we have past peak hawkishness globally. So it's, it's quite quite interesting um, environment, uh, this, and obviously why the Euro and Swedish Krona are still you know, having this kind of strong moves is that we are the last ones, they're gonna keep on being very hawkish, or relatively hawkish, I should say. Uh, obviously on the backdrop of a very poor, poor uh, economy, but then again, you can avoid those sectors, um, and then you can w wish your neighbors that worked in retail, you know, good luck, it's, it's gonna be a, an awful year for them. It is an awful year for them, actually. Um, and then you can debate in the coming years, was it the right or wrong move? As we said from the beginning, we think it was the wrong move uh, from, from the Riksbank and, and, and ECB. But what can they do? They have the mandates they have. So i.e. we're back to politicians and can they change the mandates? Well, probably, probably not. Um, it's going to be... Um, 
it's going to be a different discussion. Um, that said, uh, it's quite important now to realize this rate hike financial conditions as a driving factor of the equity market is very, very low. It's a collapse and almost disappeared. So what are we looking at? We're looking at GDP. We're not looking at actual GDP. We're looking at high frequency models of GDP, front end GDP with six to nine months. That's what we're looking at. Or, or, or just this one quarter, if you're looking very nitty gritty data updated. And this is why the equity market is also quite, quite bouncy, uh, given the fact what's happening. So in terms of financial conditions, stable in, in, in US, it's actually also, we think, troughing in Europe. Uh, we think uh, in terms of equities and macro, you can see that a rebound now back in, in India, which is great. That's an investment we have. We can see that we're getting a little bit rebound in China. We took a partial stop loss. We have a small position back on there, which is great that we see this kind of rebound. If you look at internal factors in the US equity market, which we, we, we have the biggest exposures, you can see that the daily range indicator, i.e. smart versus dumb money, so-called, uh, is, is troughing and rebounding. The net margin depth is also rebounding. In terms of sentiment, it's looking quite strong. This, the election effect was very, you know, very noticeable. If you look at Twitch data to anticipate future equity sentiment, you can actually see a strong rebound. If you look at our risk indicators, this is just rate spread, CDSs, FX wall, fixed income wall, you can actually see that we've broken through the, the benchmark barrier, i.e. we're all back into full-blown optimism. I'm exaggerating a bit, but it's, it's sort of uh, really important to capture these moves, I think, uh, otherwise your, 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 your portfolio will be worse than index and, and uh, not to mention the competitors. Now, in terms of highest lows, advanced declines, bullish bearish, you can actually see a huge rebound here as well. Uh, we talk post there, so now we're clear. Um, so in terms of the sell-off, we have no points of the, any sell-off being exhausted. And this is just the RSI and the percentage of, of you know, how big a percentage is moving a, a better or worse than the, the, uh, the, um, the, um, the index. I would like to highlight this right-hand graph. We can see that this current quarter, since the 1928s, is very strong. If you were snoozed, you lost in the sense of this. Uh, you could argue that we went a bit early, but luckily our trough since June is holding up. We haven't made new lows. I, uh, there was, it was great for us to, to be able to forecast this end of the year. Uh, hopefully it's going to be maintained throughout uh, December. Um, and so we can at least mend a little bit of, of, of the loss that we made this year. In terms of our daily trading model, which is sort of the uh, other uh, side of the coin from financial conditions, do we see counterpart risk, dollar liquidity or, or volts moving? Yes, they are moving, but as you're moving into lower and lower risk, I should argue for a higher and higher uh, uh, S&P 500. And very encouragingly, the flows are now back supporting the equity market, uh, which we think is going to actually be the new driver coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and I think you can easily translate this into this FOMO expression, fear of missing out. We have a lot of people that have missed the equity bounce you know, since June. They might have missed what happened in October. They might have missed the pivot. And all of a sudden, competitors that are, are loading up on equities are starting to look, we're all down, but they might look relatively better. That creates a little bit of a panic, uh, forced buying, you could argue, uh, which for us that are already invested is great, because uh, then obviously we're going to be better off. So this flow is quite important for the time being. Now, if you look at PE and compare it to rates, and you put it sort of on this theoretical framework that Greenspan and Powell have been arguing, i.e. the Fed valuation model, it's a buy signal. So equities in the first place, it's really interesting now because obviously this huge drawdown in equities would have been awful if we had been, as we are, overweight equities. But remember that a global bonds have performed equally as bad. So for us, it's been easy to be tactically active in, in equities. And also do note that we are now pricing an ISM level of sub 40. If that was not to happen, equity market has overdone this and have to rebound quite aggressively. That's our case. And it's quite an easy case. We've seen that in the past, 94, 95, and then the economy can slow down. We don't care. Uh, as long as you don't go into a full-blown sharp recession, that has not been priced. Um, this, and the slowdown will be sort of just, you know, fine. That's what we've been pricing. Um, the risk reward here, however, is that the economy will not slow down as fast, as sharp as the equity market has priced. Now, why are we in that camp? Well, because um, the, the timing of the earnings revisions, they already troughed. 
due to the fact that the economic surprise indicators are moving up. And you can look at uh, Goldman or Westpac or Barclays or Citis or, or, or Bloomberg's. They are all troughing. Uh, and you can actually see positive momentum now if you look at Europe and US. Uh, so it's quite an interesting situation where the economic momentum is surprising on the upside, finally you could argue. Um, and you've been quite handsomely rewarded by being tactically active versus index. Um, if that is an equity bounce, which we think, and it's happening right now and has happened for some time, and the end of the year could be could quite important on how you, how you position. We're maxed out and overweight equities. Um, global bounce is obviously happening. We don't have to go through the US. We're still, you know, shopping and growing great. Uh, we don't. We, we never saw a recession in 2022, and I think those calls were severely misplaced, as we've been arguing from time to time. The recession risk in the US is what 25 percent for the next uh, three to four quarters. Um, now, I tried to make this graph a bit more easy to read. I might have completely failed. Um, but this is the credit risk uh, in indicator for a few recession from the Fed. We have a 26% risk for the time being. And obviously, if we break into the north side, that's when we become a bit more concerned. We're not, i.e. The, the recession risk is around 25% for the next 12 months. Uh, now, hard data, lumber pricing, railroad cargoes. Uh, if, if, if containers are loaded or unloaded in, in US ports, the uh, electricity usage, steel and, and cement usage in China, port activity, volume trade, they are all rebounding or very, very strong. Uh, so this, we can't really see hard data falling uh, or, or models. Now global GDP models, this is just Bloomberg's, and this is our indicator for, for the OECD indicator, they're both troughed and rebounding. Now, Looking at this graph, it's almost a bit challenging, but remember the blockification trade that we've had on for so long, i.e. don't own anything in the Eurozone, because as the world troughs, Eurozone will go into recession. That's been our, our, our main strategy, and that's been working quite really well, actually, this year. Now we shifted back to Eurozone, because we think, that, yes, we all know now that we're going to enter a recession, so we, we, Eurozone is going to trough at the end of the day, and that's because the rest of the world has already troughed. It's quite challenging as a Swedish retail owner, I can imagine, or a retail uh, person like myself, to look at the world that has been rebounding for, for five months. And uh, you know, you, they have the retail sales in Sweden collapsed before Rix Bank started hiking rates to a level that we haven't seen since the great financial crisis or the 19th crisis. It's, uh, you, you, it's a degree of envy and frustration, for sure. Um, but it, maybe you, that should have sparked a bit more reaction uh, versus our, 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 our chosen politicians. Because I think the mandate from the central bank has to be looked into quite heavily. Because obviously they, they aren't nimble and can't follow this. And maybe they shouldn't, maybe they should. In the current statute, they shouldn't. I would argue maybe in the future they should. So don't see it as a blunt criticism of their work. They're doing what they're doing with their mandate. But it's quite interesting to, to look at the world which is rebounding and growing. If you look at US and China, uh, US was supposed to grow by 0.6% in the fourth quarter. What are the high frequency models telling us? The, the first one that's out each quarter, the Atlanta Fed, 4%. It's a huge gap between 4 and 0.6. Obviously, the US can afford hiking rates. Sweden and, and, and Eurozone and Europe are entering recession. Can we afford hiking rates? Well, if you naively hide behind the, the CPI measurement, yes, you could probably argue for that. Obviously, that's more supply driven, but this becomes very entangled with a lot of, lot of long term consequences, which is why we are increasing our exposure to Eurozone very carefully. We are also choosing equities, single equities in Sweden, with a huge exposure to the manufacturing global world rather than the, um, the Swedish domestic world. But it's quite also encouraging, if you're looking from a global mandate, to look at the US and say, well, well this, we can't really see a recession here, i.e. if the equity market sort of price a recession, which it has, um, then it's wrong for the next quarter as well. So you might have to adjust those bets, especially if the Fed starts to signal they won't hike as much because the CPI is falling over quite rapidly. Uh, and then you're off to the races. That's been our strategy and, and it's working quite, quite well. Uh, we were probably being, you know, perhaps too stubborn at time. And, and, and obviously we had our own share of stop losses, like part of the big one in, in China. 
Um, but we, we're clinging on to this strategy. Um, obviously also encouraged by the fact that if you look at a, a um, Aruba Debold Scott business conference, you can't really see a slowdown. If you look at SAM rules in terms of labor market, you can't really see a recession. So if anything, this is the end of 2023, 2024 story. But we fade this story and we utilize rebounds as we've been doing since June. Um, if you look at official data that is used by the US to highlight or front run recessions, you can't really see a slowdown either. Uh, in terms of global growth, which I think is quite important, uh, yep, still growing, bigger, bigger time, uh, actually growing almost 5% on year year. You can't really see any freight activity data showing anything else. So it's really uh, Europe and Sweden here is the, are the old ones out creating a recession on, 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 on our own basically. Um, but that said, we think it's time to start to expose ourselves to the Eurozone, given the fact that the equity market hopefully is doing its job to anticipate their trough in actual GDP data within the next six to nine months. Um, that said, um, you know, we, we, we are obviously hoping that you know, global credit impulse indicator like this one will be proven right. So we actually have an expansionary in, in, in global credit. Now, this is obviously helped by, by Asia, so we're still, we are still to a small degree invested in China, but we are we're holding on to our big investments in, in, um, in, in Japan, which is actually is working quite, quite well. It's quite interesting to look at the Japanese consumer compared to the Swedish consumer. In Japan, you have actually a really good wage growth. You actually have a very good consumption uh, growth. Um, it's very few years when, when Sweden is showing the, the so poor data in comparison to Japanese data. But it's also quite, quite obvious for, for us why we've been investing in Japan for such a long time. Um, and, and why we're just now starting to allocate more and more in Sweden and doing this with this tilt towards manufacturing. That said, um, the, uh, the uh, strategies are pretty much uh, as, as we've been speaking about with the new exposures that we've we talked about. We've been trying to, to capture this trough in, in European equities, uh, Eurozone equities. We allocated more to Nordics, but don't forget this is also currency play that we did ahead of the elections. Betting on a split chamber will decrease the probability of fiscal policy, i.e. everything depends on the Fed, they can't hike, i.e. lower dollar. If this turns out to be the case or not, it's too hard to say in terms of the, uh, the House of Representatives, but so far this has been the right call in terms of the markets. Um, now we are obviously every day working to improve uh, the portfolios and we'll be back uh, in a week's time to see what we've done. Um, but it's quite, quite interesting to see that the market is trying to spread and most importantly uh, we're getting good flows into the equity markets. The, these flows are actually also finding Europe and they're finding one specific sector in Europe. That's the, and I mentioned this before but that's the insurance and banks pretty much of the finance industry. Uh, which is where we sort of invested as well. So it's quite, quite interesting data that we get from flows for the time being. Now, with that, I will thank you so much and uh, I will be back later on. And uh, we always update on social webs uh, so, or, or, or social channels. So please be in touch with us there or, or give me a call and I will see you in a week's time. Thank you so much.